Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. We've been studying together in the book of Acts. This is an overview, a, a survey of Acts. Uh, and we're, I think we're somewhere around chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Saul was there consenting to the persecution and the death of Stephen, and there was great persecution against the church, that is, those who were called out by the grace of God. The city of Jerusalem and those who were scattered around Judea and, and Samaria ex, ex, accepted the apostles, and we find that Stephen was buried, and Saul then started to wreak havoc among the church. We have no idea what kind of, uh, 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 of an organization that the church had at that time. The word uh, there in the text is ecclesia, those whom God had called out, the called out ones. We know that by this time the Holy Spirit who's called Luke to write this book is no longer telling Luke how many believers that there are. Uh, we went from a handful to 120 to 5,000 to a great multitude, and now nothing's mentioned anymore. It has been uh, variously estimated that by 110 AD, probably at least one, of, one out of three, possibly two out of three of all the speaking world had heard about Jesus Christ, and many had accepted him. It was a tremendous explosion of growth. It's an indication not that these people have never been God's people, but that they were God's people, and now the Word of God was touching their hearts. When we look at Saul, or, or Paul as it comes to be known, he, he was a wealthy man. He was a man of some power, and now he has given himself with great zeal to hunt down and kill Christians. The Pharisee of the Pharisees, a uh, diligent keeper of the law of God, and the problem with Christianity was an extreme problem for the Jew because what was being preached was essentially to throw away all that they knew about the law and all that they knew about the Word of God. Now, that isn't true, but that's the way that it sounded to them. They were totally committed to half-truths. You know, that when the Messiah came, he'd be a great Messiah. He'd deliver them from persecution uh, and uh, rule over them and make them the great leading nation of the world. And they didn't see the necessity of the death of the Messiah as the substitute, as the Lamb of God. They never did recognize the suffering Savior. To declare that Jesus Christ is God is to violate one of the opinions at least that they had of the Old Testament Scripture, that the Lord our God is one God and there are no other gods beside Him. And so to suggest that Jesus Christ was another God, and that's what it might have sounded like, was nothing short of blasphemy. And so we find in verse 3 that Saul uh, basically home invaded uh, members of the church, uh, entering into every house and committing men and women to prison. Because of this persecution, those whom God had called according to His grace were scattered. God has a certain way of doing things. They went everywhere, and when they went, they went preaching the Word. They preached the Word. Now, in the next few chapters, we're going to see preaching the Word and preaching Christ, and I'm certain that that's what most modern ministers contend that they're doing, and I think it's imperative that we give some thought as to what the Word really means when they preach the Word. I'm assuming that it means exactly what it says. They didn't, they didn't preach what they thought about the Word. They didn't preach what they thought the Word ought to say. They didn't preach the Word in the sense that they were giving... Uh, you know, instructions on, on what to do in order to, act, to gain merit or favor with God. They preached what the Word said simply and straightforward. And they did it with boldness. We are ministers of the gospel of reconciliation. We're to point out that God did something, not that God might do something if you do something or, or 
something like that, or, or just if you were to solicit him in the right way. Not that if you made some kind of a move, then God would accomplish something. Rather, we are to declare, as they did, what God had done. We declare what God has done. So they preached the word. So Philip went down to a, a city of Samaria. He preached Christ unto them. It's, it's a simple verse, and yet as, as far as the Jew is concerned, he would have had nothing to do with the Samaritans. Philip went uh, down and preached Christ unto him. Now we have the preaching of the word in verse 4, and we have the preaching of Christ in verse 5. And once again, I'm certain that that does not mean that God might do something if you do something. Most uh, modern evangelical conservative ministers would loudly protest that they're preaching the word uh, of God, that they're preaching Christ, and I trust that it's Christ that they're preaching. I think that it's a decision that you must make as you carefully examine the Word. We may be preaching Christ, or we may be preaching man, we may be preaching self, we may be preaching human works, we may be preaching another gospel, which is not the gospel of Christ, which is not the gospel that they were proclaiming. The people with uh, one accord gave heed to these things. You know, here's a Jew speaking to Samaritans. You know, had one of us been writing this, I'm certain if nothing else would have had a footnote that, you know, referred to us, uh, uh, referred us to some appendix where we would spend a lot of time pointing out the conflict that existed between the Jew and the Samaritan and what a marvelous indication this is of God's grace that Philip would go to Samaria. And I believe that, that just incidentally, the Holy Spirit has inserted this here so that we might realize that there is a dramatic change in Philip's life which was not true in Paul's life, not, at least not yet. Now, I believe without any question, the Scriptures make it clear that this, this man Saul is God's, he belongs to God, and that God, is, God in His sovereign power, His majestic sovereign power, is not only permitting, but I believe He's directing Saul in the persecution of the church so that they might be spread all over the place. They gave heed to him because what he preached was followed by signs that testified to the authority of the message, to the authority of the messenger. There was a certain man, Simon, there. He had used sorcery in that city, and he had a great following. They gave him regard because for a long time, verse 11, he had, he had bewitched them with sorcery. The word sorcery there is our word for pharmacy, pharmakia, pharmacy, or drugs. I have no idea what he did, but he had a great following. However, when they believed Philip preaching these things concerning the kingdom of God and Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So they were separated from the sorceries of Simon and they believed what was preached about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. That is that Jesus Christ is God Almighty. He came in the flesh. Simon was absolutely astounded when he saw some of the things that were being done, he hadn't been able to do anything like that. So when the disciples heard that Samaria had received the word, they sent Peter and John down there. And when they came, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Why is it, why is it that they received the gospel concerning the Lord Jesus Christ and the word of God, and yet the Spirit was not given until Peter and John came down? Well, I believe God absolutely made it clear that the gospel was to begin with a Jew and then go to the Gentile. Not in reference to importance, but in reference to chronology. And that's exactly, exactly what happened. I think it's necessary to realize that there was a continuity in the message that had God's stamp of approval on it. When Simon saw that the apostles coming down from Jerusalem were able to do this and, and that there was evidence now that this is the authority, the, the, this is the seal of God and his message, then Simon believed. He tries to buy the gifts with money, which is followed by a stern rebuke from Peter who wished him into hell. And so Simon went to hell. And dearly beloved, I don't see that in the text at all. 
greed, stupidity, ignorance, you know, no doubt. Uh, whether or not Simon's redeemed, I have no idea. The indication may well be that he is. I do believe that we come near to his sin when we seek to obtain the grace of justification and the free gift of eternal life by our own works as if we, we think that we can buy it. I do know that. No, Peter didn't wish his damnation since he, afterwards he exhorts him to repentance and prayers for forgiveness. What I think Peter does is predict a perishing of his life in the spiritual sense where we can become spiritually ruined. The text bears that out. Scripture bears that out. Repentance, prayers for forgiveness. What I, what I think Peter does is predict the perishing of, of Simon in the wilderness. His wilderness is a life gone astray where faith is shipwrecked, where he's caught in a snare of the devil, no doubt, but eternally damned? I don't think so. That's just my personal opinion. So they returned to Jerusalem, preached the gospel in the villages of uh, Samaritans, uh, verse 25. Uh, once again, they're preaching the gospel, which is the word of the Lord. In other words, the good news is the word of the Lord. And yet much of what we hear today is the good news is something that somebody's made up so it doesn't appear to be what the scriptures say. The Lord came to Philip, uh, said, you know, Philip, I want you to go down toward Gaza. That's interesting. Huh. Gaza. Small world which is close to the Mediterranean Sea, as you know, a southern portion of Palestine. So he went, there was a, a eunuch, a man of great authority, and he's sitting there in his, his Wells Fargo stagecoach or whatever, whatever it was, and he's reading Isaiah. Philip comes up close to him, he sees where he's reading, uh, uh, asks him if he understands, he says no, he invites Philip into the carriage, and Philip then begins at that verse in Isaiah and he preaches Christ. You know, it must be that Jesus Christ is God's Lamb, died in our place, rose from the dead. That's what he preached. He began at the same scripture we're told in verse 35. Well, they come by, they come by some water, and the Ethiopian eunuch, he says, well, why can't I be baptized? I don't, I don't, you know, I don't see why I can't be baptized. I don't suppose a Bible survey is really the best place to spend a lot of time on that, on that topic, that word, a word study on baptism. I've already suggested to you that I believe that when the Holy Spirit speaks of water baptism, He uses water and the rest of the references are to spirit baptism. If you don't see the word water, it's probably not water. Uh, John indeed baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The concept is basically one of identification. It's what the word means. The purpose of baptism in this case was for Philip, not for the Ethiopian eunuch. We read in John chapter 1, the reason I came baptizing with water is that Jesus Christ may be manifest unto Israel. It was not necessary for the Ethiopian eunuch. It was necessary for Philip. We'll find uh, the same case with the centurion here, uh, Cornelius. For it's, it's Peter who now comes back and says, you know, this is what's happened. We got the same testimony from Philip. Uh, those those uh, who are great fans out of you out there, those of you who are great fans of water baptism, that's something I don't believe this is a fitting place to suggest if you look at the prepositions and you're a strong Baptist, well, they obviously went down into the water and they came up out of the water. Uh, therefore, it must have been immersion. On the other hand, the prepositions are more often translated. Uh, uh, they went down to the water and came up from the water and the Presbyterian would now strongly argue that they only went to its edge and it was either pouring or sprinkling and I'll leave that up to you. If God wanted you to, to know the method used, it, I, I kind of figure he would have told you something other than uh, 
with prepositions. And, it, and it's unfair to divide the church of Jesus Christ and have people get so mad that they fight each other over baptism. You know, I've personally known of individuals who quit churches or would stop going to a church because they didn't baptize the same way that they thought the person ought to be baptized. Or people that wanted to be baptized in every way conceivably possible to make sure that they got baptized right. So, what does that preposition mean in absolute truth? Going down into the water. Into. That's the word ace or ice, however you want to translate it in the Greek. It's translated 523 times to, and it's translated only about 50 times into. So, obviously, you can see the prejudice of the translators here of putting it under water. I do not know whether he went down and was immersed or sprinkled or poured or whatever, but in this case, water was used and the Holy Spirit says so. I believe that the purpose of water baptism is assigned to Israel, as God said in John chapter 1, verse 31. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. Now, as soon as this happened, the Lord caught Philip away. Now, that would seem to indicate that the eunuch was sufficient on his own now, and he went on praising God and rejoicing. Uh, Philip was found at, uh, at Ashdod. That's a Philistine city, a little ways north of Gaza, maybe 40, 50 miles north of Gaza. How he got there, I have no idea, but that's where he was, and he traveled through that region preaching the gospel in all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Now in chapter 9, we have the account, I guess for most people's consideration at least, of, of false conversion. Depends entirely on what you mean by conversion. The, the scriptures tell us that God separated Paul from his mother's womb. That God uh, was, chose Paul in Christ. He chose him in Christ before the foundation of the world. So surely we have an indication in the ninth chapter of Acts of 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 uh, this whole idea of repentance, change of mind. Uh, he went into the high priest. He wanted uh, authority to go to Damascus. I'm not certain uh, why to Damascus, but he wanted to go there to any uh, Jewish synagogues and make arrests and bring people back to Jerusalem for trial. So it was probably, you know, a false change of mind. Uh, so Saul, he draws near to Damascus on his journey. Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. Uh, he fell to the ground. He heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Uh, he says, who are you, Lord? Uh, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Uh, now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. It's common, I think, for people to preach great sermons on this. The first question Paul asked was, Lord, what do you want me to do? And then we launch into to these grand sermons on Christian service. Now, I don't mean to belittle, belittle or undermine or whatever that, that concept of service at all. Uh, not in the least. I don't mean to belittle, belittle, belittle. I have a hard time with that word. Belittle. That I do want to point out that this is not the first question that he asks. The first question he asks is, Lord, who are you? And by far and away, that's the important question. It was later on that he asked, Lord, what will you have me do? He fell down to the earth. He heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? That's the question. That's what Christ asked his disciples. Isn't that what he asked his disciples? You know, who do you say that I am? Who out there? Who art thou, Lord? That was the question that was of supreme importance in Paul's experience. It's, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. You know, the, the thing that fell against the heels of the ox if he didn't go the right way that you want to, you know, and pull his weight. 
And obviously God is saying here that all through this experience, He was pricking Paul to move him. Been very hard for you to uh, try to disobey God and disobey God's leading. You can't do that. You can't kick against the pricks you won't, because you won't win. So there's an indication in the fifth verse of the sovereignty of God. That was a hard thing for Paul to do, but he was directed by God. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Well, where am I now? What do you want me to do? And the Lord said, well, I'll tell you. I want you to go into Damascus and somebody there will tell you what to do. And Paul lost his eyesight. He was uh, led into Damascus. He didn't eat or drink anything for three days, uh, which made him very ill, very weak. Now the Lord comes to Ananias and, and said, Ananias, I got a fellow out here I, I want you to talk to. His name's Saul. Uh, Ananias says, Lord, I've heard about this guy. What a tremendously evil man this guy is. This, the terrible things he's done to your people. And the Lord said, He's a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. That's a very polite translation. The Lord was very blunt with Ananias. Basically, none of your business, Ananias. He's mine. So Ananias goes his way. I will show him what great things he must suffer for my name's sake. We see in the book of Acts that the disciples went around exhorting the brethren daily that with much suffering they must enter in. Yet what I hear in much of today's preaching is that if you can remove suffering, if you'll just get close to the Lord, if you're suffering, that's a perfect illustration that there's something wrong. There's, there's some sin in your life, someplace that you're disobeying. You know, there's something wrong. If you'll just get right with the Lord, then you're up on cloud nine and everything will be fine. The very first thing that God tells Ananias, and I assume he has Ananias tell Paul, is that he's to show him what great things that he must suffer for my name's sake. And I believe it's imperative that we recognize that God has called us to a life of chastening, instruction, discipline, suffering, filling up that which is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. Paul was to suffer, not have an easy time of it, and he did. He suffered. Great one. I don't suppose there's any way we could even enter into how much suffering took place in his life. What a, what a dramatic change in his life, in his lifestyle. And in the persecution that he endured. So Ananias did go his way. He put his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, Brother Saul. At least Ananias surely listened to the Lord. Brother Saul must have been pretty difficult for him to say that. And Peter, we hear Peter declare, even as our beloved brother Paul has written in hard words, hard to be understood. There was a bond there that always exists among Christians. We may not always see eye to eye. We may not always see on every point, you know, be on the same level experientially but we're brothers and sisters in Christ acceptance is such a big part of our lives as Christians we've been accepted in the beloved I can't imagine not accepting someone that God has accepted when he's accepted me in the beloved or to not accept someone that God has accepted. I'm certain that Peter and Paul, uh, both Peter and Paul, didn't see eye to eye on everything. Ananias must, must have with fear and trembling said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So here's a man who's a Pharisee of the Pharisees, a man dedicated to the Old Testament Scriptures and the law of God. Uh, Paul sees Jesus as the Lord of the Old Testament. 
But the Lord of the Old Testament is the Jesus of Nazareth where the multitudes cried out, crucify Him, crucify Him. We died on a cross outside the city of Jerusalem. Ananias says, He sent me that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. I think it's important that you realize the Holy Spirit clearly says that there are two things that Ananias must do. He's to, he's to come to Paul in order that Paul may see and that Paul may receive or, or be filled with the Holy Spirit. Those are the two things that Ananias was commissioned to do. And immediately something like scales falls from his eyes and his sight was restored. He got up, was baptized. It says, receive thy sight, baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit. And there's no water mentioned. The emphasis being on seeing, being identified with Christ, and possessing the Holy Spirit. The word water is missing. In, in, a, in addition to that, the context argues for a parallelism between the verses, receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. He received his sight and he was baptized. It would seem to me one would have to absolutely close his eyes to consistency to fail to realize that being filled with the Holy Spirit was synonymous with being baptized in this particular context. And after taking some food, he regained his strength and he spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. The Holy Spirit doesn't tell us really what went on then. It must have been quite an experience. Here, here is Saul fellowshipping with those whom he had arrested, stoned, thrown in jail. And immediately he preached Christ in the synagogues that he's the Son of God. And now for the fourth time, third or fourth at least, we are told that what they preached was the Word of God and what they preached was Christ, not some, some kind of of a, of a subjective message, but an absolute, open, and apparent objective message that Jesus Christ is God and that He rose from the dead. That was the question the Lord presented to His disciples. What think you of me? That's the all-encompassing question. What do we preach? Jesus Christ is Lord. He preached Christ in the synagogues that He's the Son of God. Well, that seems like, I guess, that's, seems like the wrong place to do it because that's where He had received the greatest conflict. The greatest objection. Right where He who had been doing the persecuting, He, he was now preaching that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You know, it's a very easy thing for us to consider that Paul was a pagan and will now, and now he's accepted Christ and he becomes a believer. The truth of the matter, dearly beloved, is that the man was highly skilled in the Scriptures, chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. If he'd have died as a baby, he would have went to heaven. He would have had to know the... the first five books of the Bible by heart. He would have spent years studying the Scriptures. He would have been fully versed in the Old Testament Scriptures. Now all of a sudden, light has shined in his heart. We are told that God commands light to shine in darkened hearts. There's a veil that remains on the heart until it's removed in Jesus Christ. You know, the Orthodox Jew does, doesn't know there's a veil on his heart. You know, he may, he may protest loudly his skill in the Old Testament, but my Bible says he doesn't know there's a veil on his heart. So there was Paul uh, with a veil until it was removed. God removed it. God removed the veil. And instantly, because of God's preparation, because of God's dealing in the life of Paul, because of all the roads that the Lord took him through down, that all... Everything, every circumstance in life that he traveled through had prepared him for this. Life and training. Now he goes into the synagogue. You know, it'd, it'd be a mess for anybody to cross swords with Paul theologically. I don't think I would have wanted to do that. 
they had no more training than he had. In fact, we're told that he, he excelled over other members of his own nation, being more exceedingly jealous or, or zealous for the Scriptures. And so Paul now becomes an, an enlightened expert. You know, whereas before he was a veiled expert. Now he's a, an enlightened expert. All that heard him were amazed, not only in his logic, but the fact that he was, uh, he was the one who was destroyed. He destroyed those who were called by God uh, after the name of Jesus Christ. In fact, the reason he came here was that he might arrest Christians and take them to the high priest. Saul increased more and more in strength and he confounded the Jews who dwelled at Damascus proving that Jesus is the Christ. Proving. Proving. How did he do that? Well, he took a trip back to Jerusalem and found the tomb, proved that it was empty, and he had all this proof. I, I don't think that's true. I think many times we get wrapped up in proving the truth of the Word of God, uh, the deity of the resurrection of Christ. I spent years trying to do that myself. I think he proved it from the Scriptures. I think sometimes our very emphasis on uh, physical, scientific, and human proof and archaeology and and whatever else, has in fact obscured what's really important, and that is skill in the use of the Word of God. Here he is in the synagogue. He's dealing with those who profess themselves to be super experts, and I believe it's from the Scriptures that he proved that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ, the Christ, the Messiah. And they couldn't dispute that. I believe the proving was done from the Word, not by some pilgrimage to Jerusalem to search out the tomb and prove that it's empty and then examine the human possibilities of the body disappearing and, and so forth and so on. I don't think that there was anything human about it at all other than the skillful use of the Word, of proving that Jesus was the Christ. That's the heart of the message that Jesus of Nazareth is, is Jesus Christ, the promised Messiah, and after many days uh, were fulfilled, they took to, to kill him, to kill him. They couldn't handle it any other way. They didn't have the ability to see or, or to speak as he did because there's a veil on them. But Saul knew about this, so they watched and waited where they could get him out in the open and then they'd take him, but the disciples took him by night and they let him down in a basket in the wall and he got away. Now, if you read, a, if you've ever read or if you do read the Fox's Book of Martyrs, you know, it's a really heart-tugging account of many who died. Uh, I'm not sure one should properly call them all martyrs. Many of them, I think, committed suicide. You cannot dance into the presence of your enemy and say, well, you know, the Lord will take care of me and, 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 and not some way call it suicide. Now, I'm, I might have been a little strong there, but we are told here in the book of Acts that Paul was let down in a basket by night and escaped from those who wanted to kill him. Why didn't he just stick out his chest and walk out the gate and say, you know, I am under the sovereign power of God and if God wants you to touch me, you can and if He doesn't, you can't. Folks, I don't see that kind of presumption in the Christian experience. The disciples were driven out. That is, the believers were driven out because of persecution and they went everywhere preaching the gospel. In fact, the Lord had told them, if you're persecuted in this city, flee to the next one. You won't even have gone over all the cities of Judea until the Lord comes. I don't think the Lord has ever called us to presumption. In fact, we have the Scriptures declaring, O oh Lord, keep me from being presumptuous. I believe absolutely that God is sovereign. You folks know that. If you know anything about me at all, that's absolutely... God is directing here, and, and it may well be that the thing God wants you to learn is not to be presumptuous. Paul wasn't. 
The disciples helped him escape. Well, the obvious place to go is Jerusalem. So that's what he tried to do. He went to Jerusalem. He wanted to join with the disciples. You know, boy, these are my brethren. These are also those who have come to be new creations in Christ. You know, we believe the same thing. We're brothers. We're sisters in Christ. But they were scared to death of him. And in verse 26, we're told that he was unable to do this. They refused to believe that he was a disciple. That tells me I need to be careful what I think of you folks. It tells me that y'all need to be careful about what you think of me or anybody else. I don't know what kind of an effect that might have had in Paul's life. It was Barnabas who brought him to the apostles who pointed out what had happened, what he'd heard. Paul preached boldly in Damascus in the name of Jesus and they took him then into their fellowship. In verse 28, he stayed with them moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. And he talked and he debated with the Grecian Jews. Remember them? They're the ones that started up the, the whole controversy, argument, debate, whatever about the poor widows. Paul, he preaches boldly in Damascus in the name of Christ. They took him then into their fellowship. Uh, he stayed about them moving freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. And he talked and debated with these Grecian Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the brothers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Once again, I believe the disputing was in the Word of God, not in scientific disputes, but in handling the Word of God correctly versus incorrectly, standing for the truth of God's Word. And in standing for that truth, they went about to slay him. I believe the same kind of objection comes in, in the world system today for those who really stand for what it says rather than what tradition would lead us to believe. There's great opposition. They sent him to Tarsus. Now, I do want to comment that Paul declared that those who were of Jerusalem added nothing to me. God does not respect any man's person. They, they who were of repute added nothing to me. It was God who changed Paul's life. Not Paul who changed his life for God. The church had rest throughout all Judea. Two things happened. They walked in the reverence of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, and they multiplied. No longer does the Holy Spirit mention numbers. But uh, here are believers who are walking, first of all, with their eyes on Christ and led that is controlled by the Holy Spirit. Now we jump back to Peter for a little bit. Peter came down to, uh, to Ludda, modern Lud. Uh, I know your text reads differently. It's a city on the way to Joppa within a day's journey of Jerusalem. And there he finds a certain man named uh, Aeneas, uh, eight years a paralytic, and he healed him through the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who were in Lutta were then led to turn to the Lord because once again the Lord had promised that signs would follow them. We'll find that these signs, uh, we'll find these signs evaporating once the Word of God is complete. In addition to that, he goes to Dorcas and Joppa. He raises her from the dead. And it came to pass in verse 43 that he spent a long time there at Joppa with Simon. And now we have the account in the 10th chapter of Cornelius, and I'm going to stop right there, and Lord willing, we'll pick up at verse 10 next week. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you once again for the time that you give us to study your word together. Open our eyes and seal to our hearts that which is truth. Strike out anything that's error or foolishness or of the flesh. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thanks for watching. Rest in Him.